Kevin, what's going on, brother? Welcome to the show. Appreciate you having me, man. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's been a little while since we last talked uh, at length. You know, we were at Harrisburg, uh, the Great American Outdoor Show, I guess. And I definitely wanted to get you on the podcast after we kind of connected there a little bit to kind of set the stage for the conversation. Um, open up with like a, a brief intro of yourself, background, how you grew up. We'll start there. So born and raised in northern Wisconsin, um, lived here pretty much my whole life. Um, I did uh, a little bit of moving around like towards college. I played baseball over in Minnesota and lived over there, um, but primarily lived in Wisconsin and grew up hunting and fishing in Wisconsin. Um, like most people, you know, started when I was real young, 12, um, fishing since I was a little kid. And I guess to kind of trail into the hunting thing, you know, I was definitely brought up like most other people up here, you know, hunting over fixed stands, over bait piles, maybe moving around a little bit, but I mean, pretty much that, that was the deal. And I did that for a long time and killed a lot of deer doing that, you know, and that's how both sides of my family hunted. So, you know, and to about high school, I probably hunted like that. And then once I got into college, both uh, different sides of my family, they had like, you know, an 80 and my other side of the family, my mom and dad's side had an 80. Um, so anyway, they both ended up losing their properties, sold them, you know, just for whatever reasons. And then it kind of got into college and I didn't, I didn't have private land to hunt anymore. So I was forced to do the public thing. And right at about that time, I'd kind of reached like the maximum, you know, size and age of deer, number one for the areas that I was hunting and number two for like what you're going to kill hunting that way. Um, you know, I'd shot my biggest one at the time was probably 115 inch eight point, maybe three and a half years old, which was a pretty old buck for the area. And actually it's funny that deer had a, a knock lodged in the back strap from earlier that year. Somebody shot just under his spine and the, the knock was still in there. So, I mean, definitely heavy pressure, but anyways, you know, once I kind of got into the public land thing, I also, you know, wanted to start targeting bigger deer and, uh, did actually some hunting on the ground and just kind of whatever, you know, for a season and didn't really have my, actually I could have killed, you know, a couple deer, but wasn't really having much success as far as big deer goes. And that was right about the time that, you know, custom, I think it was before custom gear launched by a little ways, but like XOP was around. And I know um, my first setup was like an old lone wolf alpha. So it was a little, little while before uh, custom gear launched, but, but that was my first setup was a lone wolf alpha and four sticks. And then once I got that, it, everything changed. You know, I had a couple buddies that, you know, had climbers and things, and I just wasn't really comfortable with them. Ones that were out there at the time, just, I didn't really like it too big, too clunky. And anyways, uh, got the stand and sticks. And that was also about the time that podcast really started to get popular. You know, um, white knuckle was big at that time, Todd pregnants, um, and those guys, and through that, you know, I got introduced to guys like Dan Infall, um, Andre DeQuisto, and then that kind of started to morph, you know, my hunting style. Once people get wind of those guys, I mean, you know how that kind of changes your way of thinking a little bit. And uh, so anyway, I, my first year doing that, um, I had gotten that stand in the off season, I think, and kind of went to set it up um, to where. I was going to like scout hard and like, okay, th this is going to be my style for next year, you know, is like stand and sticks. This is how I'm going to hunt mobile. And then that spring, I think I'm trying to think what spring is seven, 16, 17, right in there, uh, 2016, 2017, I started scouting in preparation for like, okay, now my style is going to be hunt public stick and move. And, and this is, this is how it's going to go. And um, I guess from there, you know, it's been, that way ever since and my encounters with big bucks um my kills have all gone in a in a good direction and it's it's a complete 180 from you know how i grew up hunting to kind of how i hunt now and i don't really i don't want to rabbit trail too far but i guess that's that's kind of the quick slash not quick of how i grew up and kind of where yeah. things are yeah so it sounds like um you were kind of forced into that situation which led to a great thing. Um, and it, it, I don't want to say it kind of fell in your lap, but it timed like the timing just worked out with losing the property, 
uh, transitioning from, you know, the permanent kind of inside corner field edge type hunting into the public land mobile thing. Cause that's, I mean, honestly, you have Dan and Andre and Cody and like the public scene with the hunting public and all of the mobile scene, like it all had exploded between yep. 2014 and 2018. Like, so it's just, that's, that's unbelievable timing for a young person to kind of get their feet wet um, with so much new content coming out. So that's, that's kind of cool. I guess walk us through some of the the areas that you hunt. I know that you're, you kind of gravitate towards the big woods and um, that's really the reason why we had you on the podcast. We've had some listeners, uh, you know, act specifically request some big woods type content with less terrain uh, or elevation change. Cause we talk about, you know, hill country, et cetera, quite a bit. Uh, but I know, remember, I remember going back to some of those Harrisburg conversations that you're more in a more flat terrain, big wood style, maybe a little bit of marsh, maybe, maybe a little bit of uh, a little bit of that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess the stuff I grew up hunting is a little bit further north than where I live now, but not by much. I mean, maybe like an hour. I'm living more central Wisconsin, but it, it's right at the point where you know, just nor right in my area, there's a lot of sections of big woods, but there's also a lot of, a lot more farm ground than there is like, you know, an hour north of me or so. And that I like where I'm at now, just because of the fact that there's, there's more ag, there's bigger deer, there's, you know, there's more of them and there's not as many wolves. There, there still is wolves, but I guess, um, I'll kind of describe the, this, and I still hunt, you know, the stuff up north here too, but it's pretty much, it, it's a big mix of terrains. Like we literally have, you know, tag alder swamps. Um, there's tamarack swamps, um, big giant sections of Northern hardwood, cedar swamps, um, cattail marshes. There's flat grassy stuff. There's everything, even some hills, um, even some decent elevation within like the more, what I would call flat stuff. Like there's sections where you can get really good rolling stuff there's sections it's it's very diverse i guess is is my long point and i really like to i guess gravitate towards the bigger woods that have ag ground near them um and big woods that have some sort of you know it, there's got to be diversity like there's some stuff around me i guess near my house it's pine plantation right and it's hundreds of acres of the exact same stuff you know i hunted a lot of that growing up i hunted a lot of stuff that that mixes and there's i guess what i'm trying to say is you know there's there's areas that have a whole bunch of monotonous you know northern hardwoods let's say that is just flat there's there there's nothing for for a long long ways eventually like that's going to end you're not going to have that forever so the biggest thing i guess that i key in on when looking, I guess we can transition to maybe what I'm looking for in the big woods. Um, I'm looking for edge transitions, you know, the, the typical stuff, but I love water and I love swamps. And I, I'm going to kick this back towards swamps a lot because even though it's big woods, you know, by me, there's a lot of, a lot of swamps that mesh into the big woods. And even though the hills aren't real steep, you know, you still see elements of hill country type bedding in there. And that that's kind of what I want to talk about too. And really hammer home is like as much different bedding as I've looked at in, in and around my area in big woods, um, there there's elements of everything. You see them, you know, bedding in swamps, you see them bedded up on hills, you see them bedded watching roads, you know, on downwind sides of clear cuts, you know, all that stuff. And I guess in order to get good i think at the type of big woods that i'm really in i mean i i know there's big woods like out in pa where you know it's it's 10 20 square miles of hardwoods and rolling hills and that's it like that's not quite what i'm talking about i'm talking about more like you know northern hardwoods maybe it mixes in with some you know some tamarack some pines and then some tag alders with a trout stream running through and then it goes back up into northern hardwoods you know for an expanse of miles and miles. That's the kind of stuff that I'm right. usually in. And uh, yeah, man, I think number one, uh, w once I started to really, and I'm, I'm still getting a, a good grasp of it, the more different terrains I've, I've hunted, the better I've become around home in the big woods. Because if I see, and it's all about, you know, reading what the sign tells you, but if I read the sign of like, okay, 
I want them to be bedded down in this swamp. It looks awesome. You know, there's a big giant section of northern hardwoods and there's a a pothole swamp, you know, with some conifer type trees in it. That's a common scenario up by me. I there's a lot of times like before I really started spending time over in western Wisconsin in the hills, I would just force it in those swamps. I'd want them to be in those swamps and you'd find some sign, but a lot of times I'll find them bedded up on the hills overlooking those big swamps that might not necessarily be as thick you know as they look or they're just they don't set up as well as the hill does for them to get the wind advantage and the sight over that open swamp so I didn't really start figuring that out until I started spending more time in the hills and that helped me you know identify that around my home and then kind of know exactly what to do then having hunted hill country and then just you're switching into that mindset rather than hunting swamps i guess does that kind of make sense yeah no definitely does and it sounds like um like a lot of us you're focusing on on edge right you're looking for those uh transitions or those you know where two different types of vegetation meet create an edge deer are, are, are edge creatures by by nature um and it sounds like that's where you're getting started but i think it's interesting that you talked about you know not forcing things because i think when a lot of people talk about swamps myself included i want to look at swamps because in my mind, I think it's easier to pinpoint where those deer are bedded, right? Like you, you kind of follow like the shoebox scenarios uh, with fingers, um, you know, hardwood fingers going out or points going out into the swamps and then a little isolated islands of willows, or that's what we have a, a lot around here is a, a lot of like willow pockets. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, you went down that path and then just realized like, Hey, you know, the sign's not telling me the deer are here. The mm -hmm. sign's telling me they're up there. So when you are breaking down a piece like that, you know, you've done your digital scouting, you, you've, you found diversity, you have a, a, an area of focus. When you get boots on the ground, like what are the, some of the things that you're looking for to kind of track yourself back to those beds or bedding areas? I guess. Yeah. And that was the one thing I wanted to kind of hammer on to a little bit is obviously like we're all, we're all looking for, you know, transition and edge and things like that. But what, you know, what is the actual goal? Or I guess, you know, this more back goes into my hunting style. I'm definitely the guy that he's in on bedding areas for sure. Um, that, that is what I love to do. That is, that is probably my favorite piece of information to find is where a big one is laying and that it just ups your odds so much. So that's really what I'm trying to key on. I'm not, I'm definitely not like you're, your stereotypical rut hunter that hunts funnels that, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not good at that. I really am not. I I'm good at once I find out where he's at and like what's going on, then I can make the plan of, you know, what I'm going to do. So that's, that's definitely more my style. But on the other hand too, I, I wanted to, we'll go back to your original question. One of the number one things I'm looking for obviously is sign, but the type of sign, you know, I, back when my goal was to shoot a 120 inch deer, I was looking for different things than I'm looking for now. What I'm looking for now is big buck sign. And it's, it's doesn't necessarily have to be big, tall rubs. That is like number one for me is big, tall rubs, like diameter of the tree, not as and we've all, you know, heard this. I'm not the first guy to come up with this, but I believe it to be 100% true that the height of the rub is a direct correlation to the age of the buck, hands down. Like what it's got on its head, who knows, but age of the buck, like for sure. So, and it's it's so consistent that it's just, that's what I'm looking for. And I want to find that, but big tracks are awesome. You know, uh, big scrapes, really, it, that's not really the, I'd like to see a smaller scrape with a huge track in it. You know, it, big scrapes are nice, but big tall rubs big tracks if you know if they're there and i i'm a little hesitant on the big track thing because you know and again i'm not also the first guy to talk about this but you know as an example the last three big ones i've shot two out of the three have had doe size feet mm. and they were one was a four-year-old one was a five and a half year old one was a seven and a half year old and the two older ones had smaller feet and I, it was so I've seen that a lot too. And, and I've seen it enough to where, like, I think it happens a lot more than people think. Like I, I've seen a lot of really, really big rub lines with 
small tracks going down the trails or it doesn't really look much different than the other doe trails that you're looking at. So right. big tracks are awesome and they're, they're easily identifiable, you know, but big rubs are super important to me and yeah. big rubs that are near, you know, number one on the property. So I want to see big rubs just on the property. If I see them out in the open hardwoods where I'm not going to hunt great, like that tells me they're there but I want to see big rubs near some sort of edge, near some sort of terrain feature that looks like bedding. But I will also say that I'm definitely the type of guy that looks more for overlook type spots and spots that people miss than, you know, putting on 10 miles this weekend in the big woods. Like I put a lot of miles on in the vehicle too. I put a lot of miles on, you know, looking at maps and trying to, you know, discern what people are going to do. And even in the big woods, I've found that the majority of the the big ones I've run into are not 10 miles back. Like they're, they're not, you know, as everybody gets back, man. Like it, we know how it is nowadays. I mean, especially if we're talking big woods, that's like dry, you know, big woods, that's, that doesn't have water in it for a long ways. People are going to hammer down trails. They're going to walk up ridges. Everybody does that. But what they don't do is think outside the box. Like people are very predictable. And I have found that, you know, majority of time, if you got, you know, typical scenario up by me again, you know, okay, we got a section of Northern hardwoods and there's maybe some swamps scattered throughout, you know, a Creek that has a swamp, you know, floodplain and then Northern hardwoods or whatever. There's going to be, you know, clear cuts, there's going to be logging roads, there's going to be walking trails, you know, that go through the property, um, trails that people can drive through, you know, for a ways and then gates and then, you know, kind of walking trail thing. I think everybody's familiar with that. I'll tell you how many times I have seen where the biggest stuff I've found is watching either the stuff where people drive in, watching the walking trails right next to it, you know, like not far away from it, if the terrain is there to hold them. And it could be, you know, that could be a pothole of crap, you know, that's wet with humps in it and trees. That could be just one really nice ridge with thick cover that's just set up in the right spot, you know, to hold them. It just could be, a, a, you know, anything, any little bedding feature that people talk about. If you see that in a spot where, you know, people just drive from the main road and they go to the gravel and they go, as soon as they hit that gravel, they're going to go for a ways. If that stuff is right there, like that's, that's the first place I'm looking, even I've, in big woods. Anywhere. I've seen that. I've seen that play over and over again. So many in so many different scenarios in the big woods that that we hunt in uh, in southern Ohio, particularly around hiking trails and bridle trails. Right, you know, people get that point two miles back, like in their mind, because they have a pin drop there, and they're and like a lot. Of, and I'm guilty of this too at times. Um, you get in a mission where like you're not thinking about what you're walking through and not observing your surroundings, you're just focused on getting to the point that you have, you know, the point of interest per se. Yep. And it's like, you're walking through so many opportunities that you're missing. It took me a while to catch on to that. But to your point, a lot of the bigger deer that we find in the big woods, they have a different chink in their armor. Like I know yep. everyone's talking about the upper one third leeward sides, but the biggest like four, five, six, seven year old deer, I mean, big deer, 60s, 70s, 80s, 200 inch deer, they're doing something, they're doing something different. We're typically not finding them in like your shoebox upper one third off of a certain point leeward wind. Like maybe they're in a bowl, maybe they're down on that lower one third or they're on a Northern slope and the, and the thermals are dropping in it or, or rising in a different type of uh, capacity or different type of length. And that's the thing that we've been trying to communicate probably over the last 12 months is like all these rules of thumb that folks talk about, regardless of what time and kind of terrain you're hunting, like those are good ways to get started, but you have to think through this stuff with a critical mindset and, and let, like, let the deer tell you where they are. Cause they'll tell you. Yep. And I mean, I was just going to say, you know, you saying that got me thinking of a scenario a couple of years back, a good friend of mine and I were hunting a during rifle season in Wisconsin section of big woods. Um, and this was up North Lang Lake County, actually, for anybody that's curious. And uh, we were, we were on this spot where, you know, it's a gravel road that goes way back through the big woods that you can drive for a while. And then off of it, you know, there's little parking lots and walking trails and okay. So there's a parking lot, 
that with a walking trail that kind of dumps down below a ridge point and the parking lot, you know, you got to kind of drive by it's the point set up for a west wind to blow down it. So it's facing east and we had a west wind. I think it was a northwest wind or some form of a westerly wind. And we're just checking out, checking stuff out. Like we're really not, it was a fresh snow, figured maybe we can pick up a track, follow it for a while kind of thing. And uh, anyway, we're walking down this walking trail and it drops right below this point. And we have to drive past the mouth of it to get to the parking lot, I guess is, is kind of what I'm saying. Okay. So you got to drive past where he can smell to get to a parking lot and then drop down a walking trail past like if there was a deer there that's what he'd be doing and as and we didn't think that right away going in but you know as you're walking down we're kind of looking and i'm like talking to my buddy and i'm like you know we both at the same time we're like there could be one right there like watching us for sure so we should be aware of that you know and let's just pretend like like we don't know what's going on you know so we're just walking down this walking trail and it's one of those that it's like a, you know, a mode trail that the DNR has, but it'd be like a grouse hunting, you know, type of trail. And it's pretty grown in though enough for a couple of years, people really haven't been walking down it. And all of a sudden, you know, boom, there's a set of tracks and they're coming towards us, like up the walking trail, but they hooked off right up to where this point is. And I'm like, looking at it looks like a big track. Like, yeah, that's pretty big. Okay. There's a doe track next to it like that's a, that's a buck track for sure going right up there. And so we just walked by them and pretended like, you know, we didn't know any of the wiser. And I'm like, okay, well we found where he entered the road and he walked right up the road, stopped, went right up the trail or, you know, went right up the ridge to, to bed and watched the walking trail below. So it was genius. Like, I mean, he was sitting there and anybody that came in, he could see coming from the right and he purposely walked right up that walking trail in plain sight, stopped, and then there you go. He's got his back trail covered. So it was just a perfect, you know, setup. And we're talking a ridge that if anybody were to just look at it, it didn't look good. You know, it didn't look awesome. Like, oh, that could be great bedding up there. Like, definitely not. Like, it was pretty open. You know, it looked just like any other ridge around there. But where it was positioned and what it was overlooking, like, and because of the gun pressure everywhere, that's what made it good, you know, and it, it wasn't necessarily because it had the way better cover than everything else. You know, it was just one of those things where it was a spot that, yeah, you know, he could get up there and, and get the wind right and, and do that. And that's exactly what he did. So I found where he entered the road, you know, this walking trail sat there and my buddy went back and he's like, I'm just going to pretend like I'm walking back to the truck you get where his or cover where his tracks come on. He's like, I'll bump him down. He'll probably just, you know, run this little circuit. Like we might get this thing. I'm like, yeah, let's try it. You know? So he bumps him down there and that it was a big old, we got a picture of him later. He put a, a camera up in there and it was, it was just a really nice, you know, maybe mid upper one thirties chocolate racked eight point, you know, looked mature. And he came down, you know, right to where the edge of that road is. And it was just real thick cover. And he kind of held up and, uh, my buddy at that point uh, kind of got upwind of him and he smelled him and then he pretty much blew like right there as if to say no way am I crossing that open road and he just kind of button hooked back and I'm like oh like smart move you know like, you could tell it was just a smart move by an old buck that had played that game before but it was just super neat like how he was set up and even though it looked like man we should we should smoke this thing right here you know still they find a way to to make it look like you didn't even stand a chance, you know, but yeah. it was just a neat, neat scenario. And it's an example of, of something that like, it didn't even have, you know, crazy. Yeah. It had spots just like any other Ridge up there. It's just monotonous, you know, hardwoods that all look the same. And that one, it was more, I, you know, where the, the Ridge was and how it was kind of positioned where, the, where the walking trails were like, that's kind of what made it good. Not necessarily like the cover on it or, whatever if that makes sense yeah no he had two out of three like he you know he could monitor the road he could monitor vehicle traffic he has the wind blowing over his back and he has the visual of anything yep. down in front of him so that, that makes that makes total sense i want to circle back on the comment about being geared towards hunting beds right so my question to you is how are you determining obviously the sign i understand that but are you a guy that has to see a deer stand up out of his bed for you to confirm like that okay this that deer is living in this bed or are you breaking down sign and saying okay i think i'm close enough 
I'm going to set up here because this looks like a staging area. I think he can make it this last hundred yards because on the map, I think he's betted over here. Yeah. And definitely like a little bit of both. Um, but I would say generally speaking, you know, especially up here, even down more central part of the state, the caliber of stuff I'm looking for, that sign separates itself from everything else. And usually, you know, you can, you can discern whether or not you're looking at a subordinate bucks bedroom or the kingpin, you know, and it's, it's so obvious to the point where like, I think people don't really understand like how obvious sometimes it really is like the difference between this is not a mature, but it's anything else, you know, it's anything else, but what you're looking for. That is number one. Like I want to see big rubs on the entrances and exits of the betting. If possible, I'll go in even during season and, and scout right in the betting areas. A lot of times, cause I'm after a certain caliber of deer, I will jump them right up. And, and I'm, I've gotten much better at that over the years. And I've killed a few doing that and, or located a few doing it a bunch actually doing it. And it's, it's an art form and it's way more effective than, than people think. And it's it, like, it's not, you don't do as much damage as you think. And I think that is probably as far as identifying the caliber, it's, it's going to be rub lines and how high they are. Number one. And if I can get a visual, I, like I said, we talked before about the track thing. I don't want to, I've seen too many big deer with small feet that I can't, big tracks are great. And if you see that track, like, you, you know, I mean, everybody yeah. knows, um, but I definitely, you know, rub lines in the bedding right on the ins and outs of the bedding. If there's competition, um, th those big rubs are going to be more um, prevalent on the entrances and exits, and they're going to be more prevalent in the beds. If it's not as high of a, deer density or if, if there's not as much competition if there's one big tank you're after he might not bed or he might not leave sign in there so you you see both and, and i mean after you walk through through a hundred big buck bedrooms and different types of terrains you can kind of i it, it's hard to stand on one thing because there's definitely both and unfortunately like you got to kind of be able to discern what what's going on given your area you know, and where that sign should be. If you haven't, if you're in an area where, you know, there's a lot of doe, like, okay, Lang Lake County, there's a lot of does, there's not a lot of bucks and there's not a lot of big bucks, but there's the buck to doe ratio is way crazy skewed compared to like where I'm at central part of the state. If I'm up North, I'm not necessarily expecting to see as much sign right in the actual beds, maybe a rubber two, you know, but it's not going to be as aggressively marked up as a place where, you know, it's down south further and there might be more competition. A lot of times down south, I still run into the same thing where it's just one big one and they're not, you know, marking it right in where they're actually betting, but it's not far. You know, it's it's right up on the dry land from the swamp. It's, you know, on the field that they're feeding in, you know, whatever the case is. But I think rubs, back to your back to the question here, you know, rubs and big tall rubs for sure. And then um visually seeing them. And I say that because I started, you know, this mobile hunting thing, not using cameras. Like I didn't have the money to go buy even budget cameras or the time to, you know, go run a bunch of them. I just wanted to scout and I wanted to learn how to read sign. And that, you know, I did that for, I mean, just this year I used a couple cameras, two cameras. And the year before I had one that it was just literally for getting video for the show it wasn't even for like actual intel i already had the intel from scouting so i'm just kind of getting into that now and the the reading sign is is that big of a part of my game and going in and literally seeing them because you're yeah it's i love doing it i'll, I'll let you answer here but that's those those are the main two i would say yeah i'm always curious about the visual because um i've been in that scenario where i think you, you think you have a deer pinpoint from the year prior you've scouted postseason scouted you found beds etc cetera, etc cetera. and then like you play the game and like you just can't close the distance you can't get yourself in position and i've been to that point where it's like all right i don't know where he is like i'm just gonna walk until i bump him mm -hmm. and like and then i and then i know but yeah. when you're doing it when you're doing it with purpose right and walking into those those areas knowing you're trying to get a visual i have to assume you're being smart with the wind and you don't necessarily, I mean, do you worry about them getting a visual on you at all? Or is it kind of 
Like if he, if, if he sees you, he sees you and, and then you're going to do your business afterwards. Well, it depends on terrain for sure. So if we're talking, you know, like swamps, for instance, swamps is the hardest for sure to do this. And you have to rely on, you know, other things, maybe not necessarily a visual, you might have to rely on sound, you might have to rely on sign, you know, going in and like you bump them out and you don't see them, but like you're going in reading the sign right there. Like, oh, here's his big fresh rubs. Like, okay, well, I'm going to assume, you know, that it's the one I'm after. And again, like I'm, I'm after deer that most of the time you're going to be able to discern the difference. So I want to be clear on that, but, um, open type terrain, you know, even Northern hardwoods, hills, um, it's much easier than people think. And paying attention to the wind is really key. But I think being able to, you know, be comfortable walking in the woods, not sounding like a human being, like is so important. And I walk in the woods with a lot of guys. And I, that's a skill that it really, it might sound dumb, but I, not a lot of people talk about that, but like just knowing how to slip through the woods quietly and paying attention to where your scent is blowing, keeping it off of the areas you want to go look at, not coming in straight downwind. I'm coming in at, at, at a crosswind. That's definitely the best way to do it is to try to, you know, before you do it, you're almost, you're sitting there, you know, if I'm going to go bump, you know, a ridge point, let's say, um, which is the easiest example. Um, but we'll, we'll just say that you, you got to have the wind set up for the buck to be bedded there. And I definitely think that, you know, the more you do it, you'll, you'll look at your map and say, all right, well, let's go, let's go bump, you know, these three, four or five points, you know, off this, this spot. And let's just see what's there. If you want to try this, you'll find that, you know, maybe two or th two out of the five, maybe three out of the five will have the wind coming down it or coming across it like you think because a lot of times it changes and then once you kind of find like oh yeah it says it's west but because of the way that this is shaped you know this it's actually coming through like this once you find that out then you can kind of find out more of okay well if it's doing this then it would make sense for deer to be better you know here and here and here rather than where i originally thought you know so dialing in exactly how the wind comes across the specific terrain features is key um but you know if it's swamp i'm just i'm trying to be quiet i'm trying to come in on on some sort of a crosswind um and trying to you know just slip in there and just not sound like a human as much as possible and you'd be surprised how close you can get they'll let you get really close if you aren't sounding like anything threatening and you know, it's, it's an extremely effective tactic. And I think, you know, if people practiced doing that a little more, you know, when you're scouting and just walking, plowing through the woods, you know, you probably don't jump that many deer. Maybe guys are thinking like, yeah, I scout all the time and I hardly ever, you know, bump deer right out of their beds. Well, are you really like, I'm, you're trying to sneak in there. Like I'm, I'm trying to sneak up on these things and bump them out. Like they're going to hear you. They're going to sense you, but try to freaking sneak around, you know, and, and really like get your spidey senses going, sit back a little bit, you know, think about where they're going to be at. You know, is it, if it's wide open hardwoods, okay. And you got, uh, you know, a little bit of a roll to the land and, and the wind's coming across in such a way where you think, okay, like there's a good chance they might be bedded on this slope and what's on the slope for bedding. Well, there's five, six, you know, falling down trees and some clumpy stuff growing up in there. Well, okay, that's where I'm going to expect them to be. Or if it's like, well, there's a kind of a flat land, but it, then it drops real hard for whatever reason, like, you know, a couple, three feet and it drops to this different type of terrain. Okay. Well, I'm going to expect them to set up on this edge rather than in these brush clumps. You know, it just depends on what you have and, but really think about where you think they're laying and, you know, kind of sneak in accordingly. And that, that takes, you know, walking through a bunch of betting areas in or betting scenarios in your area in the terrain that you hunt to get familiar with how exactly they set up you know it, it varies but yeah. that's that would be my my uh thoughts on that i guess when you're doing that throughout the season are i mean are you are you looking at that are you looking at those scenarios like okay i need to confirm a deer's here and i'm on to i think i have an idea where i'm going to set up or is it more like 
what Andre or Cody would talk about, like bump and dump, like you're bumping that deer out of its bed and then you're like playing the J hook and you're setting up right there, waiting for that deer to come back the next morning or the next evening. If the scenario sets up where I can try to do that, I will do that. And I have done it and it's uh, but it depends on the time alluded, you know, I, I have a job like most people out there and I don't get every day to do that. So that's where, or, you know, even if you have a few days, the wind might not set up consistently enough for you to try to predict like, yeah, okay, he's going to be back in here. A lot of times, you know, like this year, for example, I hunted Illinois, like we talked about earlier, I was in Iowa for a while. So I hunted Illinois pretty much all year um, exclusively. And I didn't run, you know, I ran a couple trail cameras once I, you know, got some primary scrapes identified and, uh, and that helped me a little bit, but uh, right away, you know, and for most of the year, even with the cameras working, I was literally going through and again, looking at, like we talked about before, bedding areas that are going to set up, you know, today for this wind, and I'm going to go and try to bump deer and sneak up on deer and bump them and see, you know, what is actually here on the property and try, cause I'm, I'm not out after something small or, you know, if you're just out after a buck or a decent one that's i would be doing things differently for sure but i'm after a caliber that is definitely bigger than you know just the run of the mill situation so being able to visually see them is very key and it's the most it's the quickest way that like you're going to you're going to get on one right i i'm not shining i'm not glassing and in wisconsin that's the shining and glassing are my top two i would say shining is number 1 for locating like big ones and regardless of where they are, that, that could be in swamp. It could be in big woods. It could be in wherever, you know, it's uh, flat prairie ground farms. Um, I, I shine a lot, but if I don't have that, it's either trail cameras or you're going and bumping them up and visually seeing them to see what you're dealing with or you're hunting sign that you stumble across in the meantime. So it's like either I'm going to stumble across that, holy crap, that's a freaking big one, like sign, or I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to bump one up and pick, you know, okay, he could be bedded here. He could be here, here, here. I'm going to bump these spots because there was a guy parked, you know, down over there. So I got this little section to look at. And in this section, I think, well, there could be two spots, you know, where a big buck might bed. And then strategically, I'm going to try to bump, you know, as many or bump as many deer as you can to try to visually see them and you know look at what you have and in the meantime if you stumble across something then you know that changes the plan does that kind of make sense absolutely i'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit and come at this from kind of a mainstream hunting media sure. yep. angle here uh, a guy hunting private if you were on a hundred acre farm it's still after you knew there was a big one there maybe you didn't know where he was bedded would you still approach that scenario when you're handcuffed to those property lines would you still approach that scenario in the same manner where you're going to walk in you're going to get into those bedding areas and get a visual on that deer standing up out of his bed or would you hang back and play it play it safe well um so i had a scenario that was actually just like this and actually is where i killed my biggest wisconsin buck it was just like this um it was an 80 acre piece that was probably 20 of it was really what i was hunting um, there was a little field that was mostly hay in the one in a little bit of corn up by the road in the one uh, corner. Then there was like a 40 of 12 year old, probably um, clear cut, you know, that was grown up in really high stem count aspens about that big around that. I mean, it's, it's like this, you know, walk and, through it, yeah. and the other part of it was like storm damage, like a, a tornado had come through and ripped down a bunch of popples. So there was a few like standing popple trees and then they cleaned up the rest of it. And that was pretty much what I was hunting. They'd come through off the neighbors and come through that out to crops across the road. So in that scenario, um, I shined a really good buck for the area. The first year I hunted there, probably a 130 class 10. And based off of maps, I could see that there was some beaver ponds right off of the property that met up with another stream and it created a nice island and a, just really good looking bedding cover around this beaver pond. And I went in there the first year and I'd scouted, you know, as much as I could, you know, up towards the property lines to kind of see 
what was going on. And all the sign told me, well, it looks like that's the deal. Like I couldn't go in there and actually bump it because it was off the property line. It was more or less like, it looks like that's the case. Let's just see. And first year I sat it and had that buck come in and almost got a shot, but uh, the water in that beaver pond, it was really wet that year and it was flooded way up into the trees more than I thought. And right at in the evening, my thermals sucked right back down to him and he got me. Um, so the next year, I kind of assumed, you know, hunting that property, like, okay. And, and after hunting it a few more times, it was obvious, like just observing deer travel. Yes. Like that's definitely what was going on. What I thought it looked like on the map, like, you know, where they'd be betting. That's definitely what's happening, you know, based on the five, six, eight sits or whatever I had here, deer consistently, you know, doing this, they're coming out of here and coming through here. So I, I didn't really have to go in there to bump them out to know that, He's bedded right there. Like, you know, if you go through, that's where, you know, your scouting comes in. Like I've looked at a ton of bedding areas in swamps, you know, that look just like this. I can't quite, I, legally, I can't, can't go over there, but I can use what I've learned in all these other bedding areas and how they usually set them up to kind of visualize what he's doing in there. And that led to, and that's exactly what was going on, you know? So second year and into the third year, that's that's how I hunted it and ended up getting that deer. But um, you know, if I had, let's say I had access to that bedding area and I could actually go in there. Um, if you know through, you know, shining, through glassing, through a sighting, through a picture, that the deer is there and he's around and it's you haven't hunted the property yet, but you think, you know, like we talked about, maybe you hadn't experienced the year before, you think he could be you know, give your theory a chance, give it a chance or two. But when you think that, okay, like it's not happening, I'm not seeing him. You know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know where he's at. I know he's around, but I don't know where he's at. Well, then it, then it becomes like, okay, I'm just now going to go right in there. I'm either going to just scout and look at, oh, geez, there's the sign I'm looking for set up on it, you know, and get closer, or I'm just going to end up going right in there and bumping him out and just seeing if he's there. And, oh, if you go in there and you have access to it and you don't bump them out, but you see, oh, he's been here. Like, he's definitely here. He just isn't here today. Like, okay, well, that's a piece of intent. Now you know he was using it. He's not there today. Where else could he be? Now you've got a spot he uses in the back pocket and you're looking for other spots. You're gaining, you know, intel. And if you do bump them out, I will we'll get to this subject now. If you do bump them out, I firmly believe that the age of the deer is, is uh, a factor on whether or not he's probably going to come back. I think uh, the more mature the buck, the odds of him coming back, I think are very good, you know, and everybody's talked about that. I've definitely seen that for sure. The older they get, they definitely lock into spots. And, you know, if you go in there and you bump that thing out, and it's a small property. You go in there, you bump that thing out. You haven't ever went in there, but you think, you know, he could be there. You go in, you bump him out and you see, holy crap. Like he is definitely here. There, the sign is here. The beds are here. It's he's definitely here. If he's that invested in that spot, why would a buck of that age class that survived that many seasons leave and completely relocate you know we all talk about like think about how hard a big a true just awesome big buck bedding area is to find it's it's not easy to find them if it was everybody'd be finding them and smoking giants every year it's not easy when you find one he's there for a reason and even if it's just that deer i've had that where shoot a big one out of a spot haven't seen one there since but it doesn't matter. Like that deer is invested in that spot for a reason. And pay, that's, you know, pay attention to that and, and know that he's probably going to come back and know that he's probably been bumped out of there before. And it's probably not, it could have been from your neighbor, could have been from a coyote, could have been a wolf, could have been a bear, could have been, you know, another deer running from a coon they saw, you know, for some stupid reason, turkeys, who know, I guarantee you they've, they've been bumped out of whatever you bumped them out of guarantee you they've been bumped out of there before by something else. Yes. Do they know the difference between humans and other things hundred percent, but you know, if you play, well, I'm just, you know, Joe blow going through here 
and bump them out and, you know, spread your ground scent out a little bit, walk around, look at stuff, just muck it up. You know, are they, is it really that much different compared to when a couple coyotes run in there, they bump them out, they smell the beds, they do a little trotting around, you know, and then they work their way through. No, same thing, you know, and treat it that way. And I'm not saying that this is what everybody should do, but like, this is how I view it in my mind. Like that's, that's how I view it. If I'm just walking through there, there's a big difference between like, if you, you know, and I'm curious as to your thoughts, but I, I believe that there's a big difference between like going up to a bedding area. I don't care what it is, hills, swamp, whatever, and bumping it, you know, for the day and you bump it out, you walk through there and you leave rather than you sneak up there. You don't bump anything. You sit, you know, 50, maybe you sit in the right spot and, and everything comes through and it's perfect or nothing comes through or whatever. You, you sit in a tree stand and you leave that scent pouring off of you, pouring off of you, all pooling at the bottom of your tree all night long. And there's a trail going right to this tree. There's scent on the tree. There's all that. I, I firmly believe that, a again, at least the big old ones, they know what a hunting setup is. They know. And, and they wouldn't be to that age if they didn't. So, you know, think about that for a second. Like, I is it really... What do you think is worse? You know, do you think getting in there really nice and not spooking anything, but knowing like they're going to find out you were there eventually. Um, if it's like a, like a Hills, let's say you hunt the Ridge and he comes through perfect, but he doesn't smell yet, you know, and, and he leaves like if it's a Ridge like of in its hardwoods or whatever, eventually they're, they're going to wander around where you're at and they're going to figure that out. Um, there's scenarios where I think you can maybe sneak up and not have that happen. But anyways, you know, no, to that point, I think that's uh, that illustrates something that not everybody has experienced. And I'm going to relay this back to a handful of years ago where I talked about, you know, getting on a deer, a big deer, and not being able to figure out where he was. And I just walked, at, you know, it was it was at that point the rut was over and it was December. And I'm like, I, I don't know where he is. I'm just going to walk until I bump him. Um and played that scenario kind of around that point. It's like, okay, I bumped him. He was right here. Let me go check to see how this lays out. And then let me see what else is going on in this area. Right. So I have that all figured out. Didn't kill the deer. The next year, I have things dialed in, right? Like the very first sit, I think I'm I'm killing that deer and I'm set up in hindsight, it's too far away, but maybe 150 yards away on a primary scrape from, from that bed. Nice tight. There was a drainage running up, nice tight pinch. Wind was right. There was a cold front that weekend. And I sat up there, sat till dark, did not see that deer. And when I climbed down, that deer walked past my setup within 10 minutes of me leaving. And at that point, it took me, he was, he was gone for a while. So to your point about knowing whether or not like, a you know, um, a negative experience with a hunting setup versus just being bumped out of his bed by something i think that is real um oh yeah i i think so i mean i really do i mean just and uh, i'll say this i think we got into this a little bit but you know i dive deeper into this end of it maybe than most people do but i 100 percent believe that they pick up on the energy that you put off they pick up on what you leave behind in your scent follicles that are on the ground I mean, it's been documented by, you know, multiple generation predator trappers in British Columbia that this is a thing. Like if you have, there was a guy, a real quick example, there was a guy up there um, that was attending a predator course that these three generation predator control trappers were teaching. Okay. And they talked about the fact that, you know, they had a guy that he was having some problems at home be it alcohol, be it whatever, who knows what it was. He just was not in a good place. Okay. He, and he was a wolf trapper by that's what he did for his job for the government, I believe up there. And he, for a season or a half a season or something, he could not kill a wolf. He could not do it. He just was not having it finally ended up like, you know, resolving whatever issues he was having in his life. And eventually he started catching wolves again. They found out that they will, they can pick that up, like your intent and, and what your intentions are or, or whatever, you know, there's, I'm not an expert. I just know that it, this goes on. Your dog can pick up if you're pissed or not. I mean, that's, they, they know. 
and, and you can leave it behind. And I believe that they can 100% detect that. I think they, they know what that is, or, and now dialing it back to what we were talking about before. I think they know what that is. If they trail your scent to a tree, your scent's pulled around the tree, there's scent of you going up the tree and whatever, like the, the ones who have been hunted before, they, they know that I, I believe. So, you know, if you think about that and you kind of play just Joe Blow, you know, walking around now, I'm not saying that you should do this, you know, in the middle of November when there's a whole bunch of guys, you know, around hunting, this isn't the time, you know, it's not the time to necessarily do that and pick your spots. Like I also don't, when I went to Illinois a few years back, I went down there, never scouted this place before. I just went hunting where people weren't like, I'm not going to go in and scout, you know, these three ridges when there's two, three cars in the parking lot and walk under people. And I don't want to do that. You know, I I'd rather hunt where nobody is anyways, <laughs> but then I'm also, you know, I'm scouting and stuff where I know nobody's going to be. But um, anyways, you know, I think that's, it's a, it's something that people don't think about like, how many times I, I guarantee you they've been bumped out of there before if you've ever watched you know a bedding area if you've ever had the opportunity to like watch deer in a bedding area any deer just see like it's not they they bed down and they, they eventually one runs you know one comes in they get spooked by something you know they get up they move you know oh what was that i mean there's every day you know if you see deer coming in and out of a, a field or coming in and out of a bedding area you're going to see them get spooked by something that's not there. You know, somebody rattles the whole cage and clears the field. That always happens. So know that it's happening. Go in there. If you don't have the intel, go in there and get it. And then once you know that, holy shit, the, the plan looks way better after you know what's going on. And that is, I hunted that way for a lot of years. Like I would just go in and ah you know, I think it lays out this way. And, you know, maybe you see some deer in the distance or one crashes by you or, you know, but you really don't know what's going on. Like, but if you go in there, even if it's in the middle of whenever October and just be like, you know what? I think that that buck is in there. I think this could be a good spot. I think this could be a good bedding area. Let's just see and go in there and freaking you know, walk this property or, or whatever it is that you have, go in there, learn it, get the intel, see what is actually going on. What you think is happening sometimes isn't exactly what's going on. But when you know, you know, because you read the sign and you walk through it all, then you can hunt it much better. And for me, that has been huge in my success for sure. Like there's a, there's a give and take between like, you know, I'm not going to go in there because I don't want to disturb it. And I'll just kind of visualize in my head what I think is happening. Like there's a time and a place for that. But there's also a time and a place where you're wasting time and you need to find out what's happening, you know? 100%. A couple of questions here. Um, I want to go back to what I'm going to call, like, I don't know how to phrase this up, um, scent training. Like, we'll just kind of leave it at that. I've had this conversation with folks periodically kind of, I don't know, over the last decade or so. And some of it relates back to, again, intent and like baiting. Because here in Ohio, like, everybody baits and there's guys that kill big deer over it. And there's guys that don't kill big deer of it, but there's a, there's a train of thought there that you can train an animal not to, to be able to, to detect your scent and know that you're in there, but not necessarily relate that to danger, whether you're checking cameras or corn feeders, whatever the case is, do you like just quick, real short, and I'm going to move on. But do you think that's a possibility? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I think so. Um, and I think it, that kind of goes into like what you're thinking in the tree, like when deer or animals are walking by you, you know, we all, I mean, you get jazzed up, man, and your heart's pumping and, and stuff. But I think, you know, if you really pay attention to, even when does come through, man, it, it's exciting, you know, especially when they're close, but if you really focus on, you know, I'm not here, there's nothing here. And I'm sure as hell not going to kill you. You know, you I have no intent of harming you. Like, and just think that way, you know, repeat it in your head. If you, I, that's what I do. Cause I can't like, that's how I have to think about it. Like I'm not here. There ain't nobody here. Just keep on going. You know, I ain't here. You know, I'm not, not making eye contact. <laughs> um, I'm, def I'm definitely not, you know, but I'm not here. There's nobody here. And I think, you know, if you have that in your mind of, I definitely, when I was setting traps, you know, like when I was a beaver trapper out of right out of college, that was my first job. And um, when I was doing that, like, 
and I started becoming more aware of like what we're talking about, I definitely like made sure that I had just a good, clean, you know, clean mind, clean intent. You know, I was focused and, you know, there's, there's not, there ain't nothing here. Don't worry about this, you know? And it's not that it maybe makes no difference at all, but it's, it's something that I think if you can, I think it's real. I, I, and I think to what you're saying, like for, for sure, but that's kind of how I would like relate that in, in my mind. Uh, you know, the eye contact thing is something that a lot of people don't talk about, but I, I agree with that a thousand percent, like avoiding eye contact in that moment of truth. 100%. Yeah. That's something that my grand, my, my grandfather used to do a lot of, a lot of spot and stock stuff, you know, and growing up kind of underneath his wing, that was one of, one of the things that like he tried to pound home to us. Like if you have an encounter, whether you're on the ground or in a tree or whatever, like you're not staring that animal in the eye. Like, and I know some guys are like, I'm going to yeah. stare, I'm going to stare at that thing in the eye. And I want him to know, like, he's the last thing that <laughs> I'm the last thing that he sees before he dies. Like, yeah. You gotta have both those mentalities, but that's something my grandfather always, like he pounded that home to, to us growing up as, yeah. uh, as teenagers. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's for sure. I mean, it, and you, you know, when you're bumping them on the ground, like we've all walked up on them, you know, at different times of the year in the spring or, you know, whatever bedded and all of a sudden, you know, uh, <laughs> as soon as, as soon as that happens, like it's over. I mean, yeah. you can, you can look the other way and pretend you didn't see <laughs> it, but like they know, but it's amazing. Like that whole time beforehand, people talk about it all the time. Right. And it's not always like, Oh, I made eye contact with them. Then he jumped. Like sometimes they'll, they'll just tolerate it to a point, but how many times have you, walked around and all of a sudden you you looked at one and you oh no i didn't see it i didn't see it and then you know two seconds later the thing takes off and that was that was what did it um yep. yeah it's happened last year on my elk hunt like i had that thing at five yards or whatever and for you know i did not intend to to shoot that bull and then we locked eyes and it was like oh like he's gonna turn around and leave like this this gig's up like and just ripped yep. one at him um yep. Okay, so I want to circle back to we got a little bit off topic, but that's good. There was some good stuff in there. I want to circle back to picking the kill tree around these bedding areas. Um, and I'm going to ask a very general question, which I know there's not going to be a, a direct answer, but generally speaking, how far are you seeing these bucks? And this is not rut related, you know, consider this early October. Just let's just say the first three weeks of October. And maybe the answer is different as we go into late season, but how far are you seeing? seeing these older bucks move away from their bed during shooting light. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a hundred yards give or take is, is a good general rule. I mean, you, you want to be as close as you can, you know, I've seen it where, you know, the one I shot two years ago, he probably moved, you know, away from that beaver pond, maybe 120 yards, maybe tops. I mean, but it was a good half hour before dark, you know, I mean, it was fifth day of season, and he was, he moved a good distance at that point. I've seen him, I've hunted deer in November that kind of knew I was onto him, bedded in, you know, big woods scenarios that moved 50, 60 yards or 70. And it depends on, you know, the scenario, but I think you, you have to err on the fact that you, you can't expect them to, to move a further distance. I mean, I've, I would way rather find out exactly where they're laying and push too close than hang back because I've hung back too far for too many years and wasted too much time, you know, and especially if you're after a certain caliber of deer and you either want to get that visual or, you know, you won't, you don't mind bumping them. It's, it's important to, to push it as far as you can, but I would say like, don't, don't expect them if they're mature in any kind of pressured area to move more than a hundred yards in daylight you know, if you're lucky, if you see that, you know, it's going to be early season when they haven't had pressure or it's going to be, you know, late, uh, maybe if it's super cold or whatever. I like early definitely more where I'm at because we don't have our late season kind of gets screwed up here with doe hunts and um, things like that. Muzzle loader season, just the way it kind of lays out. It's hard to, to get out late season, but early for sure. Like if, if they're, if they're moving, you know, more than 120 yards, I mean, you're, that's, that's good. That's what you want. And sometimes it's less, you know, sometimes if it's, you know, October lull, you know, people want to say, or crappy weather, they don't have really a need to move and they don't. And if they're in a bedding area that there's food all around it, they may move even less. You know, if it's big woods that uh, the acorns are great and there's a lot of acorns around the edges of those swamps, 
they might really take their time coming out of those swamps to get to that dry land because they know they're going to sit there all night and eat. Why the hell would they rush up there? You know, they never do though, you know, if they're old. So, but if they have to travel a little ways, that's where you're going to get, you know, you're going to get that movement. Um, if, if you can find that scenario, I guess. But I mean, even during the rut, I think, um, people have this vision of like giant bucks running wild and like it, obviously it happens like they're on their feet more than any other time of the year. I, I get that. But my point to illustrate there is that deer I shot a couple of years ago in Kansas, he moved 65, maybe 70 yards from his bed on November 11th or 12th. Um, mm -hmm. Hot does in the area. There was does all, being run by young bucks all over the place set up there. And it was now he moved early. It was four o'clock. I think when I, when I shot that deer, maybe four 30, but that whole encounter he went 60 yards from his bed and it took him 15 minutes to get from the edge of that cover, like right on that transition line. It took him 15 minutes to work from that transition line, another 10, 12 yards where they're like, where it started to open up and where I shot him. Yeah. I mean, and I don't, I think if you don't have the opportunity or you haven't yet to hunt and pursue a mature deer and like really get in tight with their movements and see that for yourself it's hard to like grasp it it's hard to grasp it when you know like once you do see it like that you realize how little of a chance you had on a lot of hunts prior and that that's kind of i think how i view it it's like i just i know they're not going to do that i hunted one quite a few years ago it was in end of october through the first couple of weeks of november and i had that thing inside of 40 yards I think four different times in a swamp It was a tag alder swamp and uh, the tag alders were in the willows and everything it was so thick that like, if you weren't on the trail, if he wasn't on the trail that was right in front of you at 15 yards, you're not killing him. Like it was, and he wouldn't come out of there. So it was, I had to dive in there after him and I had to like, just pick a hole and that's what you get. And so many times I had him run by close or whatever. And it's, uh, I, I don't even know exactly where I was going with that, but um uh, it's, it's one of those things, man, where they, they know how to use like that to their advantage. And I guess the, the distance thing, you know, all through the rut, man, he had does in that swamp. He wouldn't come out of that swamp in daylight. And it was maybe 200, 250 yards across and, you know, miles long. I mean, it was a Creek bottom with hardwoods that dropped into a, a trout stream kind of scenario with tag alders and, and tamaracks and whatever in the flood plain which is a beautiful swamp back up into hardwoods and then farm ground on the outsides of that if that kind of makes sense so just a long running swamp that's a creek bottom pretty much but he would not come out i mean i hunted that thing through the end of october through november almost to gun season and i never seen him come out of there in daylight um he was seen a couple times going back in like right away at first light in the morning and it, it was just wild to see even all through the rut. And then when you're sitting there, you know, and you're inside of a hundred yards, you know, from where you think this deer is and you can hear them, you can, whatever it's, you, you just see like, why would he get up and, you know, all these guys, you can hear guys in the parking lots, you know, you've all, you've heard that they hear it too. Um, they know there's pressure up in those hardwoods. That's where all the hunters are. That's where all the, the permanent stands are, whatever. And they're, they just have no need those big ones to go risk it because they've been through ruts before they know they can get any dough they want at any time and they can kick everybody's ass. So why would they put themselves at risk? And they just don't do it. And no matter how, you know, go, oh, you know, the much you think the rut affects them, maybe that happens for a day or, you know, or two. And are you really going to get that lucky? I'm not. You know, I know I'm not. So like, I can't plan for that. You know, I have to plan for them staying tight and doing what big deer do. And if they do that, that's where, you know, I have the success is, is thinking that they're not going to do what, you know, what we just talked about there. So, um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I got one more question and then we're going to go into like three or four rapid fire things to get this wrapped up. I think we've been going pretty close to maybe a little over an hour, but you know, something I wanted to talk about when you get the chance to, but you've mentioned it a couple of times is like your, um, your trapping experience, like through college, you know, graduating college and that being kind of your first job, how, cause in my mind, like 
you know, the way that you've laid kind of your, um, I'll call it your hunting career out, transitioning into a mobile, more aggressive style hunter, relying on sign. I would think from a trapping perspective and being able to read sign and be able to understand how animals are using the train to make quality sets that that would like automatically translate in, into whitetail hunting. Um, but I guess how, how has trapping impact impacted your ability to scout and just read sign? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, cause it definitely, it, it definitely took a little while. Um, and I think this is important too, like talking about gaining, you know, tidbits from other passions that you have in your life and having it affect your deer hunting, you know, in a positive way, I guess real quick, like, you know, my trapping, I, I trapped originally just for fun, you know, to, cause I loved it, but I got, um, lucky enough. I did get a wildlife degree and I got a job with USDA, uh, beaver trapping and, or, you know, uh, doing that uh, other things, but beaver trapping was probably 80% of the job. And, uh, you know, when I was in the mode of, you know, doing beaver control, I probably, you know, I don't know, easily over a hundred, you know, probably different beaver complaints I did, you know, throughout my few years there. Um, so you get in this routine of like, okay, you show up, here's the spot. What is it? You know, okay. It's a dam on a ATV trail and this section's flooded. So, you know, my mentor that taught me this job told me from the start, you look at the sign that they give you, you look at everything you can, and then you set accordingly. And every spot's going to be different. There'll be some stuff that's the same, but it's every set's different. Every scenario is a little different and you have to adapt. Like he pounded that into me from the start. And I had to learn my own lessons through that, but I, I definitely like learned through just adapting to every single scenario. And over time I realized like, yeah, like there's generally a way that I'm going to, you know, do it, but you got to morph it to what this spot holds. And, you know, after getting effective at it, and then also having a few beavers that like, dude, when you take a foot off of one, <laughs> they're smart. I'm telling you, they are extremely smart and they're hard to kill when, especially if they've survived a few years of people after them. And you got to get creative. And and when I've gotten a few of those real hard ones, it's made me, you know, realize that, okay, holy, you know, and then all of a sudden one day, I guess it kind of just started to click like, well, okay, when you go in to kill a problem beaver, you know, one that's you've been after for a month, like, what are you doing? Well, okay, I'm, I'm going in, I'm looking at everything that they give me, and then I'm going to set accordingly. I'm not just going to go in and, you know, set the first uh, board out run, you know, that looks good that no, I'm going to go, I'm going to keep that in mind, but I'm going to look at everything and then make my determination. That was like, holy crap, dude. Like, that's what you need to do with these properties of deer. Like, that's what you do. You, you know, do you turkey hunt uh, and you go into a spot and you don't know if there's birds there? Or do you go in to a spot that you know <laughs> that there's, there's either been birds there this week? Like, I'm very confident over my experience that there's going to be like, you know, you're not just blindly, you know, going into a bedding area that looks good on the map and hunting it because, you know, so-and-so said it looked good. Like, I did that. And again, you got to, you got to, everybody has their own path, you know, and connects things in their own way. And that made me really put things together. Like, dude, you got to like, okay, there's a big buck in here. You're after look at how much time you wasted, you know, beaver trapping in this spot for two weeks. And if you would have just walked over, you know, 200 yards over here, you'd have found the kill spot and got them both and been done way quicker. Well, it's the same thing with deer. If you would have just walked over there and found that pounded rub line going behind the old lady's house that you had permission or whatever, like you'd have, you'd have killed them, you know, right away. It's the same thing. Now, again, like we talked about before, there's a time and a place for that. Like there's a time to use your visualization and kind of hunt off your gut and what you think it's going to be but there's a time to just go right in there look at it all and when you look at it all you can really make sense of stuff and then back off and hunt it strategically so i think that's kind of how it played in in that regard and also just obviously like reading sign you know if you can detect what what muskrats and mink and coons and you know otters and everything else is doing along a stream like you're gonna deer sign is gonna stand out to you like a sore thumb you know, or a weasel track in the snow and, you know, just little things that trappers tend to see that maybe other people miss. 
you don't miss a pile of scat ever. You know, like if there's coyote scat there, I see it. If there's, if it's deer droppings, you like, you just start to look at every little thing, even in more detail in your deer hunting, because the trapping makes you really look close, I guess. Yeah. That's, um, you know, the Turkey, the Turkey comparison is funny because like, I won't go hunt a, I won't go in and, and turkey hunt unless I know there's a bird gobbling. Like I can hear a bird gobbling. I'm not yeah. going into, or I see them, right? Like those yeah. are the only two ways I'm going in in a specific piece of property or a section to hunt turkeys. Right. Like I'm not going to go set up a bunch of decoys and sit and then call. Like that's just not, you know, it doesn't flip my boat, but I've never, you know, I've never made that connection until you just made that, made that point. Like you could do the same thing with whitetails. Like I think about yeah. it, but not, not, not in that regard, I guess. Well, um, I mean, are you gonna, I, I did this like, okay, why would you like, dude, why would you go in and hunt a spot in a swamp that you think might be good based on the map, but you've never looked at it. And, uh, you know, like, why would you do that when you could go and glass shine, whatever, like, I'd rather go and go into a brand new piece. I've never been before. And I know that there's a big one in there somewhere rather than like, Oh, this looks good. And you know, let's, let's just see like knowing is it whether it's a camera picture whether it's whatever like then there's a reason but if you're just going in there like you got it so i guess i yeah i kind of tried to bring that into my deer hunting as much as i could because it ups your odds like if you're going and hunting dead stuff you're wasting time and yep. it's easy to waste time out there yeah you know um Absolutely. and one thing real quick i wanted to this is kind of i was saving this for this podcast um i wanted to hammer home like you know with my style, how I was talking about trapping, putting things together, I want to like hammer home to people, develop your own style, like do what you like, hunt how you like to hunt and shoot what you like to shoot, hunt out of what you want to hunt out of, like, you know, do your own thing and take all these tidbits from other people. But like, you got to be confident in your own ability. And I think it was Gerald Swindle, who I took this from, he was given a, he's a professional bass angler and he was given a presentation about something. And, uh, I'll, I can even send you this picture if you want, but this is a, just some bullet points off of a PowerPoint. It's called anglers strengths and weaknesses. Okay. And I think this directly translates into hunting. Okay. So this is, this is what it is. No two anglers fish the same. Some anglers have a slow methodical approach. Some anglers have a more aggressive approach. It doesn't matter as long as your approach works for you. There is no right or wrong way to fish. It should be your way. Develop your own style of bass fishing or of insert deer. Look within yourself to become a better angler. Start by building confidence in your ability. And I think that can be said for everybody in whitetail hunting as well. And I would encourage everybody this season to go and do that. Yeah, man, those are, uh, those are awesome words. I could not agree more. You know, I could, I found myself through my twenties, my mid twenties, late twenties, maybe even early thirties trying to shoebox this thing and, and like, okay, this guy's having success this way. Like, this is the way I need to do it. And like, maybe it didn't work. Maybe it did work. Maybe it worked out. Sometimes it didn't work out sometimes. So then I would like find a new idol or a new guy to follow. And I'm like, okay, well, I have to do it. I got to do it his way. The other way only worked one out of 10 times. Like I need to do it this way. And I would follow that guy. And then I quickly, you know, once we started this business, once we had Exodus and we got to meet all these individuals and realizing like there's a thousand ways to skin the cat. But the one, the couple things that every guy, every big buck killer, every killer really has in common is one, they have conviction in the pro and in their process, just like you said, they have a process and they believe in it and they have conviction in it Two, whatever that process is, they're, me they're methodical and meticulous about that process. Like you can look at John Eberhardt and say, like, throw the scent thing out the window. Well, for him, like he has conviction in it. And he's like, I mean, as methodical and meticulous about that as, as you are with your, with your scouting details and it works for him. And like, that's okay. Like you don't have to, you don't have to do it like, you know, X guy or Y guy. Like if it works for him, it works for him. Like to your point, take in what they're saying and like, think about it critically with a critical mindset. And maybe, maybe you can, you can draw from that and down the road from, you know, some experience, or maybe you're encountering some kind of 
adversity in the woods or whatever the case is, you can draw from all that if you can kind of bank it away in your mind. Right. Exactly. And 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 they're students of the game yep. too. Like that's I think that's ultra important. Like Justin Hollinsworth, he's Cisco, all of the guys that we've we've kind of talked to. And I, I mentioned Heath and Justin because I think that they're um like the perfect example of this of being of students. Like they never stop learning. Like oh, the yeah. guys have like their resumes are unbelievable. And they're yep. listening to podcasts, they're reading books, they're having conversations with different guys. And it's not just to say that they're doing it, like they're listening with intent to learn something. Um, yep. And that's ultra, like always keep that switch on in, in, in any kind of scenario. And maybe it's not even hunting, maybe it's something about life, but there's things or parallels you can draw from there hundred percent. Yep, absolutely. And I've had the pleasure to rub elbows with those guys and talk to be around those guys. And Every, all of them, they all have one thing in common. They're all still thirsty for knowledge and thirsty for Intel always. It, and that never, that never stops with all of those guys have that. Like, you know, if, if you're one of the people that are fortunate enough to watch this and like I was, and just get so bit by the, but like that thirst for knowledge never stops. And that's what I love about, you know, white tails. That's what I love about muskies that's what i love about you know the stuff i do in my life is that you're never gonna it there's that thirst never goes away if it does it's gonna get boring and i i don't believe that it ever will and uh yeah man it's awesome but it's yeah the, the thirst is always is always there and it's just amazing that you know you can do something like that for this long you know and still like i, I hope that you know i look back at what where i was five years ago and i thought i knew what i was doing and I look at myself now and I hope that I can say like, holy crap, dude, you know, I hope I can say the same thing in five years. And I hope I can say the same thing in five more years. And I believe that'll happen. I don't want to just stop, you know, and I'm not any better than anybody else. And I have, you know, the, I only have the time that I'm alluded to, to hunt and the animals that are around me to go after. And I'm just trying to knock down the biggest ones I can with the time that I got. And you can't compare you know, it's not apples to apples. Don't um, be like me and get, you know, discouraged years ago. And, you know, all you do is look through Facebook and everybody's killing stuff and you're not like, it's everybody has their own path and you can't, you just got to do what you can do. And, um, you know, just that's, that's about it, man. I mean, that's, I don't, I think that's about all I can say really. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, Let's get this thing wrapped up. A couple of rap rapid fire questions. Yeah, gun sure. held to your head. Okay. Like mm -hmm. no cop outs here. Um, gun held to your head. You can only pick three days to hunt. So you have a three day window to hunt in the 2023 deer season. What three days do you pick? First three, hundred percent. Yep. I'm looking forward to this year. I'll actually have the first week off and, uh, I haven't had that like ever the last big one I was after I hunted like evenings, but I'm, I'm taking the whole week and yeah, hundred percent, man. Um, if you're in big woods, if you're in uh, farm country, if you're in hill country, utilize glassing as much as you can. But if shining is legal in your state, shine and do as much work as you can in the summertime, right at the end to find a target, zero in on him and get it, get him killed right away before he expects any, it doesn't matter how hot it is. It doesn't matter what's going on. Those big bucks are the most vulnerable that first week. Um, I think more so than any time, especially in Wisconsin. I mean, late season, if, if you have the right scenario of private permission or something, it can be great. And I have had, you know, the fortune to have that once I don't have that anymore, but um, at the same time, like, they're not hunted all summer long. Them first three days, that's that's what I'm picking for sure. And I've seen better big buck movement if it's 85 degrees, you know, in those first three days than I do in November. So that one for me is pretty easy. Okay, uh, next question. What is, like, you spent some time out in the timber. What's the craziest thing you've seen kind of in the big woods? Could be uh, random, like, a encounter with a person. Like, it's just something off the wall. Man, um, the first one that comes to mind is uh, I shot a turkey a few years back, quite a few years back, and I was filming it, and uh, I heard something walking up, 
and as I was just taking some shots of the bird or whatever, and I stand up and there's like a 180 pound black bear, you know, just like this and nose up like he 100%, you know, smelled the bird. And uh, that was pretty crazy. Um, and I got that on video. I think, oh, duh, I can't believe I didn't think of this first. Um, this is by far the craziest thing I've seen. Um, I had, when I was young, I had a, a track job where I was involved in a pack of wolves taking down a deer and like literally shredding it at night. I didn't oh. see that, but like we heard it and it was under a hundred yards. It was wild to hear. But the craziest thing I've seen was I was grouse hunting with my girlfriend up north here. And uh, it was high noon, middle of the day, sun shining. And we we're probably a mile back on this logging road. And all of a sudden here comes a black wolf running around the corner of the logging road, probably 40 yards up ahead of us. And right away, I thought it was somebody's dog. Cause that's just your first thought. If you're grouse hunting, I've had that a lot. You know, another guy's dog comes up. Oh, Hey, how you doing? And then it clicked like, no, like there's nobody back here. And it was just, he came up, looked and then dove in the brush real quick. And the dog, my dog was going to go up there, but I told my girlfriend, grab her, you know, cause just in case. And I walked up to that thing and it was a jet black wolf, like for sure, a thousand percent. I walked up to it. I mean, six, eight foot away and it had its butt up in the air and legs stretched out just like your dog in your house, just going rough, 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 like just like kind of barking at me, but not really. And I got a real good chance to look it over. And I mean, I think a lot of people would have wasted him right there. But I mean, I had to like, get out of here, get out of here. And he would not leave. And he kind of flanked us out for probably like three, 400 yards, howling the whole time. And it was, it was wild. I've never seen one do that uh, since or before. I've seen quite a few wolves, you know, out and about. But that was the, I think, you know, because of the dog being there and whatever, like it was just, but it, it was amazing how, you know, it was, I was not in control, you know, like he was in control. Like he was, I'd go get out of here. And he'd like go five feet back and just like, Oh, like what else you got? You know, like, he'd have five, <laughs> uh, like taunting me. And I'm just like, you know, again, I'm going for wildlife college. I'm not about to dust this wolf, you know, but anyway, it was just after the fact, like, you know how you get that, like, you're not scared in the moment. But then like you're angry after that's like a human, you know, thing with like fear. Like you get angry. I was like mad that he got the the better of me almost because he was just so not afraid, you know, looks right through you. It was almost like, should I, should I take this guy out or not? Like, I know I can, should I, or not? Like that was, that was definitely the craziest encounter. He ended up, you know, working off and whatever. We just got the hell out of there, but it was, uh, it was pretty wild. I would have loved to have that on GoPro. Man, that's uh those type of encounters are cool. You know, not from a like you get that bite or flight kind of rush in your body, but like afterwards, those things make you feel alive. You know oh, what I mean? Like yeah, <laughs> for sure. It was yeah, hundred percent. In the moment, you know, I wasn't like, you know, it was like I just need to this thing's gotta get you gotta get this thing away, you know. So I wasn't like and I had a gun. So I mean, I could I could have smoked that thing with gross loads, like I I didn't, but so I wasn't too worried, but at the same point, it was just like his mannerisms. And I, I've released him out of traps before too, like incidental catches, you know, you're coyote trapping and there's a wolf. So you let the thing go. And I mean, their, their movements, their reaction time is like 10 times faster than what your dog is. Like if you can, you know, take a toy with your dog and, and it nips at it and you can pull it away, you know, from it and you, and it doesn't get it you aren't doing that with a wolf. Like there's, it's so fast. It's insane. And they're so strong. Um, and they're just an awesome animal, but yeah, it's, uh, it's wild. I've had a few cool bear encounters walked up on them. Um, few, you know, that was the craziest wolf one, some other stuff, but yeah, uh, nothing, nothing like charged or anything like that. Um, I would say that one was the, was the craziest and we just happened to cross paths, you know? Yeah. But. That's cool. All right, well, let's get this thing wrapped up. If anybody wants to follow along with kind of what you have going on, um, you know, in years to, in, in 2023 or in years to come, where, where can they find you, Kevin? Yeah, I uh, I don't really have much going on for social media anymore. I just have my Instagram and I, I'm i pretty caveman-esque when it comes to that. I haven't even ever made a story. <laughs> so we'll see if we can maybe change that this year. Maybe I'll do some, some more stuff, but I'll throw up some uh, musky pictures, turkey pictures and deer pictures and whatever up on there for people to see. 
And uh, I've been filming stuff for White Pill Addictions. There's a show last year they did of, of a few bucks I shot. I did not shoot one this last year. I did shoot one, but didn't recover it. Um, uh, he ended up living. And uh, so I'm not going to have uh, a show because of that. But hopefully this year we can change that. And I don't really do much else right now. That's that's pretty much it. So I love it. Well, man, I certainly appreciate you taking the time on a Friday out of your out of your schedule to spend some time with us and um, share some knowledge. I think there's a lot of good stuff here that people can draw from. Thank you. Good, man. I appreciate you having me on and taking the time on a Friday to out of your schedule because I know you got a lot more important stuff probably going on than me. But um, yeah, man, I hope people can get something out of this. I, I know I can go rabbit trail and talk about whatever sometimes. So hopefully there's something to draw from. I just, I have a big passion for it. I love to talk about it with guys like yourself who are real experienced and knowledgeable, love to bounce ideas and tactics off other guys. And I love to learn about it. Um, so hopefully this can give people, you know, maybe not like, you know, some advice, but maybe it gets them to think about their own style a little differently, you know? Yep. Absolutely. Okay, folks. Well, that is it. That's a wrap. We will catch you next Tuesday.